Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Avazadeh. I'm an Assyrian fertility doctor. Obviously, I'm Assyrian, otherwise I wouldn't be here. So what I'm known for is cooking eggs. I tell Mama Iran all the time, Anna Bia Beshlan Kut Yuma, and I love what I do. I was born here in Boston during my father's OBGYN residency. I did my training at UCLA and back in Boston at Harvard for my OBGYN training as well and University of Michigan for infertility. My sister's a doctor, my husband's a doctor, my aunts and uncles are all doctors, my cousin's a doctor. So if you're a Syrian, you've probably seen one of my family members. It is an honor to be here. I'm looking forward to talking with you guys more about fertility and empowering Assyrian women. Keshkan mughibit khurzat khalat attayuta min al prasta um tanata ashurata midra inshla mal tul khamana khun mghda khalakta khata min daha khurza akhshmilo khun ila ami idium ghda atta ashurata asya amy aivazade dr amy bshana titat al khurzat khalat attayuta thank you mary it's my honor and pleasure dr amy you mentioned in your opening that um your entire family is physicians, doctors. Yes. Um, did you know when you were growing up that you would be a doctor as well one day? Absolutely. From the time I was three years old, I knew not only I wanted to be a doctor, but I wanted to be just like my dad and just like my grandfather. So my dad used to bring me to labor and delivery every weekend. I would watch him deliver babies during the summers. Uh, when I was off from school, I would work in his office. I used to volunteer in the hospital and then do research in college, medical school. It was just it's in my blood. So I say I have the doctor gene and the Vazade doctor gene. Uh, when I called you the first time you spoke on the phone, you yeah. uh, I didn't know who you were. Mm -hmm. I knew you were a Syrian and fertility specialist. And you mentioned about that you are the granddaughter of Dr. Johnny A. Vazade. Yes. And I knew instantly who you were because we all know him. Right. Uh, how did he inspire you while you were growing up? Uh, he is one of those people where uh, patients would literally walk 2,000 miles to see him and he would have patients seated lined up I mean I don't even know if it was you know half a mile just so that they could see and get treated by him and he never said no to anybody anyone who wanted care he would say yes to even if they didn't have the ability to pay so I obviously learned from him and have a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of that spirit inside of me. And I also traveled to Iran when I was in medical school and worked with him and operated side by side with him. And that was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. That's wonderful. Yeah. Dr. Amy, today you are an infertility specialist and you're mm -hmm. making so many couples' dream come true yeah. every single day. Why did you choose specifically this practice. Yeah, I mean, I think Grand Papa Johnny was the infertility expert of Iran. I mean, people used to travel from all over to see him. And one of my first patients, uh, you know, in my practice here in the San Francisco Bay Area was a baby that he helped conceive. He gave the mother fertility drugs just to have her, and he delivered her too. So it was like such, such, so, so funny and uh, such a coincidence that I should see her as my first patient in California, you know, all the way from Tehran. Um, so I think that just knowing what he was known for and then just always listening to the stories, you know, at dinner time, on the phone, about patients, and it was just a, a, a natural thing for me to want to go into infertility medicine. Tell us more about a little bit about your childhood. Yeah. You were born into an Australian family in the United States. Absolutely. So would like to hear more about that. Yes, yes, yes. So I, you know, both of my parents are very, very educated. My mother has a master's degree, and you know, as as you know, my father's also a, a medical doctor in OBGYN, and so education was always encouraged. And so, you know, we were involved in lots of activities, piano and dance and student government. And I would say that that drive to become a doctor, while it was not forced upon us, we were encouraged to do whatever we wanted to do. But for whatever reason, my sister and I just knew that we always wanted to be doctors. So it wasn't something that they made us do. And so we, we took uh, learning very seriously and we took it upon ourselves to do as well as we could do in school so that we could, you know, go to the colleges that we wanted to and go into medical school. How how important do you think education is for women? Um, I think it, it provides you a freedom that uh, that you just can't get anywhere else. You know, education is the ability to reach for the stars and do whatever your heart desires. Because without that, you know, anyone can say, "I want to be a doctor." but not everyone can go to medical school. So you have to study and you know, take the MCATs and do well in school in order to do that. 
Uh, did you um, follow your dreams? I mean, you, you always wanted to be a doctor, but yeah. not everybody has the courage to follow a dream. And yeah. perhaps you wanted to do something else, but were you that kind of woman that followed her dream regardless of all the obstacles? Oh, for sure. So, I mean, of course I had people saying that you weren't smart enough, you should do something else, you know, you're, you're immature, which, you know, was not obviously true. Uh, you know, in college I had a professor say to me that you're not smart enough and I was at, I, I, I transferred from from one university to another because I didn't feel like I was getting the encouragement that I wanted to. But it was my mother, my Syrian mother, that always said to me, you can do whatever you want, just keep going for it. And I did. You know, at 17, I transferred to a seven-year Bachelor of Science medical degree program at UCLA. And without my mother's encouragement, I would have never have done that because I would have, might, I might have believed the things that everyone was saying, even though I was an A plus 4.0 student out of high school. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're one of the most successful infertility specialists in the United States. Um, what is your success, what is your success um, secret? What is my secret? <laughs> you know, fertility is one of those things that is very taboo to talk about. And I, my secret is three things, and that's PMA, and that stands for Positive Mental Attitude. And I believe in the fertility of everyone who walks through my door. They might not believe that they're fertile, but I sure do because I want everyone to succeed. And I think what makes me just a little bit different is I want patients to be successful even without my help. So I try to teach patients, educate them about what their fertility diagnosis is, and then give them the tools they need to improve things on their own before they do treatment with me. Even if, let's say, I'm going to do treatment for them, at least we're doing things in parallel so that they have the very best chances for pregnancy with whatever treatment they decide to do. What has changed in the infertility world uh, since you started practicing? Yeah, so I think the biggest breakthroughs have been with genetic testing. So you can take an embryo and you can look at it and you can see how pretty, pretty it is, kind of like a diamond, and you can give it a score and you can say this diamond is a, you know, the, the best quality diamond imaginable. And then in the old days people used to transfer embryos, these gorgeous embryos, and they wouldn't work and people would wonder why. But now you can actually tell the genetics of an embryo on the inside. So a lot of people say to me, well, I don't know, I don't want to know if my embryo has blue eyes. I don't want a designer baby. And when I tell people, it's not about having a designer baby. It's about giving yourself the highest chance for pregnancy. And if you know if your embryo is genetically normal on the inside, then you're gonna have a higher chance for pregnancy and a lower chance for miscarriage. And so that is one of the biggest changes that we've seen in IVF medicine. So the whole field of genetics is going to constantly change things for us and hopefully improve pregnancy rates even more than they already are. Mm -hmm. So um, the opportunity that you give to women to become mothers at later age mm -hmm. uh, by freezing their eggs or mm -hmm. offering infertility uh, fertility treatments yeah. uh, to them while they're older offers them an opportunity to work on their career and become mothers later in life. That's women empowerment in my opinion. What do you right. think? No, I agree. I think certainly there are some women who, y you know, they, they, we spend so much time, let's say, in graduate school and then they're done with graduate school by 32 and then they're in their career track and by the time they're ready to have a baby, they're let's say 39 and then they meet the guy at 42 and then they show up at my door and they're, they're saying, I don't understand why I have a problem getting pregnant. Well, certainly I hope that with IVF medicine we can help those women, but what I'm hoping to do through fertility education and promoting awareness is educate women that even though you might be ready to have a baby, let's say at 42, biologically speaking, your eggs might not be good anymore. And so I want women to get tested early. I want every woman to have fertility testing done by the time they're 25 and then repeat testing over time because I don't want you to be shocked that all of a sudden your eggs have run out at let's say 38 where you could have actually done something differently like freeze your eggs at 32. Right? Mm -hmm. And there are a number of women who can freeze their eggs at, let's say, 35, but you wouldn't know if that's something that you can do unless you get tested, get seen, talk to people. And your fertility isn't your mom's fertility or your friend's fertility or your neighbor's fertility. You know, I have f patients that say, oh, my friend, she had 15 eggs frozen and she's the same age as me, so I'm probably going to have the same number of eggs frozen, and that's just not the case. So you're known as an yeah. egg whisperer? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How did you get that nickname? <laughs> so I, a very sweet patient of mine, uh, long story short, I told her not to give up. I said, we just haven't gotten the golden egg yet. And so we actually got two golden eggs for her and she is now a mother of twin boys that are almost two years old in June. And as a gift to me, she bought me the website eggwhisperer.com. And she was at my first egg freezing party 
And there was a reporter there from the San Francisco Chronicle, and she whispered to the reporter, she said, that's my egg whisperer. Oh. And then the rest is kind of history. So that's where the name came from, is from a very dear patient who gifted that to me. And the name just kind of stuck. So I've never heard of egg freezing parties yes. before yeah. until I did research on you. Yes. So uh, tell me about uh, these parties. Yeah, so there are a lot of in-home parties, right? So you have like the makeup parties, the jean parties, the stretch pants, you know, the, the, all the different pant parties mm -hmm. and the purse parties. And so I am a very social person, as you can tell by my personality. Yes. And people always invite me to their parties. But when I go, I find that I'm just educating people about fertility. And I love, like, it never gets old for me. People come to me and they say, can I ask you a question? This is for my brother. This is for my sister. Can I ask you? And I say, of course you can. And then I come home from these parties and I'm like, I just gave a fertility lecture. And then every time I go to a party, I'm like, I just gave another fertility lecture. So then I sat around one day and I was like, hmm, I wonder if there's something that I can do educating people, have fun with it. And that's where I just searched online and I saw the URL eggfreezingparty.com and I bought it and the rest is history. So I've done over 26 parties now all over the country. I get requests from all over the world. I've had crews fly in from Japan, China, Holland, Denmark, Germany, Spain, um, just to name a few countries, Australia, uh, just at Canada to talk about egg freezing. And I'm not freezing eggs every day. Egg freezing party isn't about trying to get women to freeze eggs. It's working. It's getting people's attention and it's getting them to talk about fertility awareness and getting their levels checked early. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I can say this on a Syrian TV, but everyone knows that you can get a boob job, right? Every woman knows, mm -hmm. every man knows, you can get your boobs done. And there are hundreds of thousands of women every year at the age of, let's say, 30 to 32 that get their boobs done. But if you, let's say, go to a party and say, hey, do you know that you can freeze your eggs? Very few people actually know that. Very few people actually know that you can get your fertility levels checked. So I want the same number of people who know that you can get your boobs done, mm -hmm. <laughs> know about fertility levels, mm -hmm. and know that you can get them checked, kind of like getting your sugar checked, your cholesterol checked, because there's no reason why you should be standing at an egg cliff one day and look back and say, why didn't anyone teach me, educate me, and empower me with fertility knowledge so that I'm not sitting here bedbacht not mm -hmm. knowing what's going on with my fertility. What is the fertility percentage currently? Yeah. A woman between 30 and 40 years old. Yeah, so our eggs start running out even before we're born, okay? 90% of a woman's eggs are gone by the time she's 30, right? But in society, we, we usually wait. I mean, especially in this community, Silicon Valley, where we are, mm -hmm. most women are having babies around 33. So there's going to be a number of them whose eggs are not as viable. They might be able to get, well, hopefully they're getting pregnant with baby number one, but a lot of them struggle for baby number two. So talking about fertility awareness, my, one of my big things is that most people spend more time planning a vacation than they do a family, right? So when you go on vacation, what do you do? You research the diseases that are there, you get the vaccines that you need, you shop for all the things that you get, the books that you need to read, but we don't do that. If people spend, let's say, 5% of that energy on planning a family, get their fertility levels checked, then you kind of can then plan your family and the family size that you want. Because I have a lot of patients who had baby number one and then are struggling for baby number two. And they're saying to me, I wish someone had taught me. I wish someone mm -hmm. had told me about this stuff so that I don't have to you know, go through IVF cycle after IVF cycle. How do you bring the news to a couple that absolutely cannot have kids? So what I tell people, I say, look, I'm not, a I'm not a god, I'm not a fertility god, and I want everyone to get pregnant the way they originally envisioned, right? So when you get married, you, st you don't stand at the altar and say, till death do us part and I can't wait to, to meet Dr. Amy, right? I mean, everyone wants to get pregnant with their own eggs and their own sperm, but certainly there are people that I cannot help with their own DNA. And so my goal is to give people their very, very best chance for pregnancy in whatever that they do, so that they never look back and say, I wish I did something differently. I woulda, coulda, shoulda. I don't want people to have any regret. I want people to say, I did everything I could to give myself the best chance, and then this is the best, this is what God basically intended for me. Mm -hmm. Whether it's adoption, embryo adoption, egg donation, sperm donation, there's so many different ways of being a parent. And those, aren't, those things aren't failure. You know, one of my big things is adoption is not failure. Adoption is another opportunity and a way to, to start and have a beautiful family. Some people believe that all these opportunities that we have currently to get pregnant, to become parents, right. interfere with God's work. What right. is your opinion? I say, God, I do God's work every day. I say, welcome to God's house. I mean, literally, I mean, I, I went to Beth Israel was God's house. You know, that's where I trained. And 
I, I literally say that. I say, when patients say things like that to me, like, I, I'm Christian, I can't do that. You know, I can't do this treatment. I say, why do you think that? You know, if you had a heart attack, do you say, I'm Christian, I can't get my heart fixed? Well, it's the same thing. If your uterus is hurting, being Christian has nothing to do with getting your uterus fixed. If your ovaries are hurting, you, 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 you see where I'm going with that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so there, for some reason, when you bring God into it, God's will is for us to be happy. We're on this earth to love and share love. And there's no greater love than a love for a child. So God wants us to experience that. God wants us to get treatment. And so if I have a patient that's hesitant, I say, you know what, let me call your priest. I've had so many talks with priests and pastors, and the patients, they love that. They say, really? I say, yes. And then they say, yeah, oh, you're right. My priest actually said, and he blessed us, and he said, yes, you can do pre you know, treatment with Dr. Amy. So I think people have this bias that for some reason God doesn't want them or God is punishing them for something. And I say, no, it's quite the opposite. Wonderful. How does that day look like in your life, Dr. Amy? Oh, very busy. So we have a nine-month-old baby right now. So in between like bottle feedings, diaper changings, all night long, uh, wake up early in the morning, like 5.30, and then uh, get the kids ready for school. So we have uh, two older boys and a, and a almost, well, she just turned four-year-old girl. So we get them ready for school. I usually run to surgery, and my husband helps out a lot because his schedule is just a little bit different as an ER doctor. And then uh, I do surgeries, uh, usually really early in the morning, see a number of patients in the office. I can then go back for a number of surgeries. I did just did a procedure right before coming over here. And then I see more patients in the office. And then, like for example today, then I'll go to swim team from here. Mm -hmm. How do you balance your um, busy job with having four kids? It's a team. So I have an incredible husband. Uh, I adore him. Um, my happiness is his, his happiness. And he knows how much I love what I do. And so people ask me this question often, and, and one thing that he does is he says to me, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What can I do to help? Literally. So I don't feel like I have to be like, honey, will you do this? Honey, will you do this? I don't do that. I'm not one of those people because he's always asking me, what can I do to help? Dinner's always ready. The groceries are done. It's not because he's not busy. He is. But his 100% is a little bit different than what I bring to the family. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, so how are you teaching your kids about um, becoming good people? Yeah, so we go to a religious school, so that really helps a lot. And I think they see that mommy's helping people, she's doing surgeries, daddy's saving lives, he's going to the friend's house to make sure that the rice isn't stuck up the wrong nostril, you know, stuff like that. So I think they see that through modeling, they see that through their grandparents on both sides, that we're always helping other people as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, how did your parents educate you about your Assyrian background while you were growing up, Dr. Amy? <laughs> so that's a very good question. So speaking a lot of Assyrian, so they always spoke Assyrian to me. So I can understand fluently, but they didn't make me speak back. So I'm not very good in conversational Assyrian, but I can, I can, my comprehension's at 100%. That is going to change after. <laughs> yeah, I know, seriously. Um, so that's one of the ways we'd always go to convention um, every year, at least twice a year, uh, travel to Chicago, San Jose, Modesto. Um, so we were involved in a lot of community events. How do your children know uh, they're half Assyrian? Probably from my grandparents, from my parents, actually, mm -hmm. I should say. So my father speaks to them in Assyrian all the time, and same with my mom. And so my dad's always like, you know, from a very, ha, today, you know, and then my, you know, the little kids, you know, because they're so little. So it's very cute to hear them speak Assyrian. My sister actually speaks only Assyrian to her children. They speak back in Assyrian, too. That's awesome. We're hoping yeah. to have your sister on the show in the near future oh as well. Oh, my God. It'll be a nonstop comedy show. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Amy, what do you think woman empowerment is? I think, oh, God, woman empowerment is, I think, not caring or giving a, a D-A-R-N about what anyone thinks and just going with your gut and doing what you feel right doing and I think it's, it has to do with appearance and how you know just being proud of who you are how you look where you are in life and not letting any of the societal pressures kind of make you feel any less than you are because at the end of the day who really cares I mean we all come from the same place go to the same place you know what I mean when I walk in the room I'm the same as everyone else in that room and I think that when you see the things that I see as a doctor, you realize how precious life is. Mm -hmm. And so I just want every woman to stop giving themselves such a hard time. 
So you're empowering women every day, as I mentioned, every what day. you do um, yeah. with your job. Right. You're giving them the opportunity to work on their career and their education right. and become mothers later in life right. and offering them um, egg freezing opportunities, which is probably taboo right now, but it's important that we talk about it, especially right. you know, on a Syrian TV. So a right. Syrian woman know that they have the option of becoming mothers later in life and right. working on their career. Right. I mean, sperm freezing has been around for hundreds of years. I mean, sperm banks have been around. I mean, you don't, you don't use the word sperm freezing uncontroversial in a sentence, right? But when you talk about eggs, and then freezing them, all of a sudden that becomes a controversy. And I'm like, what's the big deal? Why is there this double standard? There shouldn't be, you know? When men run out of sperm or if they don't have sperm, you go to a sperm bank. All women run out of eggs at some point in their life. And sometimes that's at a time when you're not done being a mom. So we have to talk about options. Um, I don't know if we could talk about the prices of right. egg freezing. Perhaps yeah. we could educate people about that as well. How right. much does it cost? Right, so it just depends on where you live. But on average, the medical cost of the egg freezing portion is around $8,500 to $10,000. And then the medications are very expensive. So it just kind of depends on how much medication you need. But it's anywhere from, let's say, as low as $2,500, as high as, let's say, $5,000. So I tell people, if you're prepared between ten dollars and $15,000 for an egg freeze, then you're going to be fine. And then storage is about $300 to $500 a year. To take an egg all the way to an embryo and using all that science has to offer you, like genetic testing, you're looking at about twenty to $25,000. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Amy, as a woman, did mm -hmm. you encounter any obstacles in your life, in your career, and how did you overcome these obstacles? Yeah, I mean, I would say I've been so fortunate to start off my career at a time where most women were OBGYNs. So there was a transition that I would say that you saw a lot of male OBGYNs and then it was harder for women to get into the field. But I would say I came in at the perfect time where a lot of my leaders were female role, role models. And I think that was very, very helpful to me. Of course, there was sexual bias you know, in certain situations uh, at the university level and in some of my training experiences. But I never had an experience where I couldn't talk to someone and then rectify whatever situation I was facing. Speaking of role models, yes. who is your role model on a daily basis? On my daily ba I mean, on a daily basis, I would say probably my mom. I mean, I probably talk to her like, I mean, I'm, I might be underreporting the number of times. It might be six times a day. <laughs> so I say to her like, Mom, I have an idea. And then I'll call her with the idea, and then she'll say, not the best idea. I'm like, okay. And I'll be like, I have another idea, because right now I have this huge project that I'm going to launch at the end of April. I can't tell you yet, but it's huge, and it's so exciting. Um, but, you know, I have her blessing on it, so I'm very excited to start, like, a, a basically a new business. I was going to ask you how yes. the future looks like for you in five years, but I guess yes. I can't ask that question. <laughs> no, <you> can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you will find out at the end of yeah, the so month, Yeah, so it has to do, I mean, I'll tell you, basically, I see a huge issue in this country where you have young women that want to freeze their eggs, but they can't afford it. And then you have women who need eggs, but they can't afford, let's say, the fifty to $55,000 price tag on using the eggs of someone who's willing to donate it to them. So without sharing too much, I'm basically bringing those two groups of people together and sharing costs in a way that makes it affordable for everybody. So something that everyone can do. That is wonderful. Yes. And some companies... I know they have been paying for the cost of egg freezing. Is right. that right? Right. So what do you think about started, that? I think it's awesome. So what people don't realize is that the reason why that came to be is because of one woman's cancer diagnosis. So she went to her human resources department and she said, look, I have cancer. I'm going to have chemotherapy. I'm not going to be able to have kids and I need to freeze my eggs and I can't afford it. And so the head of the company said, and this is Facebook, said, well, I didn't know that we didn't cover it. Well, let's cover it. And so because tech companies are always trying to recruit people. And so all the tech companies then just started following the same thing. And a lot of them do that now. So when, when that story first came out, a lot of people said, oh my goodness, companies are trying to keep women working longer, keep them in the workforce longer, keep them from being mothers. But it's actually quite the opposite because when you're going through fertility treatment, it's depressing. You're out of work a lot. You know, all these treatments takes a huge toll out of your life. And I can tell you that if you're going to do an egg freeze, do it when you're young so that when you're looking at doing, let's say, three to four IVF cycles, you're going to give yourself a much higher chance of pregnancy using your young eggs. Mm -hmm. So uh, you think uh, we will have a trend of egg freezing coming up in the next couple oh, of years? Yeah, no, it's here. I mean, I did, uh, I've already done three egg freezes this week. 
One patient had breast cancer. She gave me permission to talk about it. Um, it was her second egg freeze. She has chemotherapy starting this week. Uh, another patient uh, also freezing her eggs for her own personal reasons in her 30s um, because she just hasn't met the right guy. Not because she wants to pursue a career, it's just because personally she's not ready to be a single mom by choice. So I was visiting yeah. your website and your motto on your website yes. is bringing hope to life. Yes. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's literally what I try and do because I see depressed pa patients, people every day all day long. People that feel like they're broken that there's something wrong with them and that there is no hope. So I'm literally like a cheerleader with pom-poms every day, all day long from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed because I want people to know that there is a plan for them. And it may not be the plan that they originally envisioned, but if they do want to be a parent, they certainly can. So when they call you, a yeah. door of opportunity up, I opens hope, up. I hope so. I mean, my job isn't like I tell people, my job, people say, your job is just happy all the time. And I say, no, it's not unicorns and puppy dogs and rainbows. You know, there's a lot of sadness. I can walk in one room and tell someone that she just had a miscarriage. I can then walk into the other room and tell someone that she's pregnant and get a phone call that someone just delivered a baby. You know what I mean? So there are certainly ups and downs. But I tell patients that if there's anyone that's going to be on that ride with you, I want it to be me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt guilty that because of your busy job, you are not spending enough time with your children, perhaps? <laughs> Absolutely. And so that's why I am so happy to have the team around me. So, for example, my husband's going to pick up the kids, bring them to swim team. My dad's going to be there with them and I'll show up. You know, I will be there. Um, when they get out of school to be there to encourage them. My husband will have the three kids there. The baby will be at home. So my kids are Assyrian. They don't sleep. I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> We're up until 10 o'clock at night. So even though I'm getting home at 5, I'm still with them until 10 o'clock at night. And then the baby sleeps with us. Um, I would like to hear your message to the Assyrian women who uh -huh. are watching right now yeah. uh, to empower them, inspire them, encourage them, mm -hmm. and give them an opportunity that perhaps they never knew they had. Sure. And I think uh, the biggest mo uh, mantra that I've I just say to myself every day is if you believe it you can achieve it and that was a high school teacher that taught me that you know when I was a teenager and so that has stuck with me to this day so I tell my patients that and then the other thing is the waiting when you're let's say wanting to get into medical school or wanting to get pregnant the wait is the hardest thing it was the hardest thing for me I knew when I was three years old that I wanted to be a doctor imagine three years old I was done with my training at 32 undergrad, medical school, residency, fellowship, I even did an MPH at 32 years old. I mean, that weight is, it's very difficult. So what I tell people to encourage them, I say, to make the weight less overwhelming is if you take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. So just focus on the moment, focus on the day, wake up each morning as if you're getting ready for the best party of your life. Literally, that's why I wear the most obnoxious pink lipstick every single day. <laughs> Because no matter how I'm feeling on the inside, no matter how tired I am, as long as I have glossy pink lipstick, I feel happy. That makes me feel happy. And I know that if I do my best today and I do what I need to take care of today, tomorrow I will just be one step closer to what I want. Thank you, Dr. Amy, no, for your in empowering, inspiring story. And to make time in your busy schedule to be here today, actually, yeah, I would like to thank your parents for opening yeah. their house for yeah. us to come here with the AMB team and um, share your story with the entire Assyrian National Broadcasting viewers. Oh, thank you, Miriam. Thank you. So you've determined you need to see a fertility doctor. Well, I happen to have fertility expert here with me right now, Dr. Amy. Hi, Dr. Amy. Hi, Vicki. Walk me through some of the procedures that, that you do and, and, and what, what you first do when someone comes to see you. Absolutely. So one of the first things we want to know about our patients is how are your ovaries working? What are your eggs like? And so there's a blood test that we can do, and that's called FSH hormone testing or follicle stimulating hormone. And we like to get that test in the beginning part of someone's menstrual cycle. And that really helps us tell what someone's biological clock is ticking at. Yeah, so we always speak. hear that it's ticking. Are some people's ovaries actually older than their physical age? That is true. About 10% of women in their 30s actually have ovaries that think that they're in their 40s. And so that could be one of the reasons why a couple is having a hard time conceiving. Okay. Well, well, fertility is a very complex thing. Are there other aspects you need to, there to look are. at? There are. So anatomy is important. So an ultrasound looking at the structure of the uterus to see if there are any benign growths like a fibroid or a polyp that could possibly be blocking the ability of an embryo to attach to the uterus. Right. 
And then there's tubes also. So there's a tube test. It's also known as a dye test. The technical term is hysterosalpingogram, and that allows us to tell if someone's fallopian tubes are open. Okay, and you also test for the male to yes, see what's do. going on there? So we like men to have a semen analysis performed so that we can look at how the sperm is moving, the count, the shape, all of those things are very important when it comes to trying to get pregnant. All right, well, Dr. Amy is offering a complimentary phone consultation to find out more. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can contact her at her office, and that phone number is 925-277-0600, or you can actually find her online at dramy.org. Thanks very much, Dr. Amy. خانمو قبل عویتون بسیم و دویلا خون اما اند خگه خیتا گرو در خلق تا خیتا من خورزد خیلت ات تایوتا اند لاخون بقاره اند لاخون تخمانیاته اون بخشه بتون ایتن غده ات تا آشورت ات بایتون خزیتون لگو خورزد خیلت ات تایوتا شاد بیتون ایمیل آل ماریام ات ای این بی سات دات کام هلده خلق تا خیتا بچه خانو خون بشنم